is very familiar yet very surreal standing here. Uh, as, as we were beginning to worship, and I was looking up here at the stage and seeing the cross that's there, a memory flashed through my mind. One that Rich Krieger would love to forget. <laughs> we were painting this building, and Rick, Rich dumped a bucket of paint on the cross of Jesus. <laughs> Fortunately, the cross of Jesus cleans up every mess, and it, you can't even tell these days. So, you know, there have been, there've been great moves of God here, and there have been other things that have just been fun and fascinating, but it's, it is great to be with you. Uh, and just to share God's word, I'm, I'm looking at the time, and I'm sure you are too. I'm not concerned. My flight's not till five <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> so relax. Let me read from God's word uh, from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2, the first 10 verses. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do, not impart, we do impart wisdom, although it is not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. For these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that it would be your wisdom and your glory that is known in this place today. That it would be you that is honored and adored. That we would make much of you. And that the name of Jesus would be lifted up, that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In his precious name we pray. Amen. So the title of this message is The Gospel-Focused Life. It's a subject that's become something of an obsession with me over the last few years. What does our life need to look like in light of the gospel? And partly it's been an obsession for me because I've become convinced that, that as Christians, we really don't know what we mean when we say the gospel. You know, we're kind of like that. We use a lot of theological words that we throw around, and we really don't kind of think about what they mean, and we really don't often know what they mean. And I'm convinced this is the case with the gospel because I see so much debate going on in the church around the United States these days over the nature of the gospel. What does the gospel mean? How does it affect life? How does it get carried out? And it gets so caught up in the cultural issues and debates of our own day that it makes me think, yeah, we don't really know what it means. And it reminds me of, of one of the, the most rich theological movies that I've ever witnessed, and I watch it regularly just to remind me of the depths of who God is, The Princess Bride. <laughs> How many of you have seen The Princess Bride? All right, most of you have. Those of you who are not, I think you're saved, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> In The Princess Bride, there is this kind of bumbling uh, criminal named Vizzini, and he is to kidnap the Princess Bride, and every time something goes wrong, he just simply says, You guys are so good. It's inconceivable. 
And eventually, one of his sidekicks, Inigo Montoya, looks at him and says, you keep on using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> and I think that's kind of how we are with the gospel many times. We keep using it, but do we really know what it means? And that even relates a little bit to our history as North Park Church. Because going back 40 years ago, this church got started because of a commitment to the gospel. But at the time, we didn't even really use that language. We were committed to the gospel, but we didn't even realize that's what the issue was. It started because we were committed to some biblical and theological truth that, as you heard Bob talk about earlier, had, had really um, come under fire with the, the denomination we had been a part of. It was a big issue because we were looking at basic truths like the actual coming of Jesus as God in the flesh in the world, and that was up for grabs at that point. We were trying to uphold basic truth that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he went as a substitute for us, and his death meant something. It did something spiritual. It was an atoning sacrifice, because that was up for grabs and debate. We were, we were committed to the fact that Jesus actually bodily rose from the grave alive after having been dead, that the tomb was empty and he was alive, and that was, again, something that people were actually within, within church bodies debating and are still arguing about in some cases. Did it actually happen? So we were committed to these things, that, that, that what we know of the scriptures, that Jesus came into the world, he lived, he died, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and he's going to come again one day to judge the living and the dead. We were committed to that as being committed to biblical and theological doctrine. But looking back, the realization is that's the heart of the gospel. That's what we were committed to. We were committed to the gospel without realizing or using that language. Because that's what Paul tells us the gospel is. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, it's a chapter that we usually think about related to the resurrection and Paul affirming the truth of the resurrection. And that's a big part of this chapter. But he starts out 1 Corinthians 15. He says this, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you and in which you received and now stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast that word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Then he goes on and says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, and most of all, he appeared to me the least. If that sounds familiar a little bit, what Paul is saying there, it's kind of the heart of the Apostles' Creed, the basic statement of what we believe. And Paul is saying, hey, I delivered to you the gospel. And then he goes on and says, this is what that gospel was. That Jesus really came into the world, that he really lived, he really died, that he died for you, that he rose again. And so when we hold to that biblical and that theological truth, we are holding to the gospel. And North Park Church exists because 40 years ago, a group of people were committed to that truth and upholding it and making sure that other people knew that truth. And over the years, it has impacted countless lives. Many of you here came to faith as a part of the ministry here at this church, and many people have gone out from here into vocational ministry of all kinds, taking the gospel all around the country and to different parts of the world because of a commitment to that gospel. What Paul said that he focused on as of first importance first and last, holding to the message about who Jesus is and what he's done. And so if we're going to have a life that is focused on the gospel as of first importance, we need to really understand what it is and what the implications are of that gospel for us. Now, when Paul went to Corinth, as we saw in the, in the passage from chapter 2, he said that he came there with a determination to do nothing but to preach Christ and him crucified. Now that's Paul's shorthand way of saying what he later says in chapter 15 that I read of the fullness of that, the fullness of that message. You know, he didn't just preach, yeah, Jesus came and died on a cross. He preached the fullness of everything around that. 
He said, that's what I came to give to you, and I focused on that. I was determined to bring you nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified, preaching the gospel of Jesus, because that's what the people of Corinth needed. But it didn't mean that Paul only preached about the life of Jesus, what you might read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. What it meant for Paul is that he preached the gospel of Jesus from Genesis 1-1 all the way through to Malachi that he knew, plus what he had received from Jesus as Jesus appeared to him. Because the gospel begins at the beginning. It starts in Genesis 1-1. Because the whole story of Scripture is the story of the gospel. It's the story of the good news of what God has done for us. And so focusing on this idea of the gospel is one that has just gripped me more and more. Because what I see, it's not only that many of us as followers of Christ don't really understand what the gospel is, we don't understand what it means in our lives, unfortunately a whole lot of Christians think they do get it and it has impacted their lives appropriately. And I'm not talking just about the casual Christian who, you know, shows up for Christmas and Easter. I'm talking about people even in Christian ministry and leadership. And that's why the debate's going on in our culture today of what is the gospel and how does it impact the way we live and how we interact with culture. Paul said, I came to you bringing that of first importance. So what do we mean when we're talking about this gospel? Beyond the the doctrines that that we would all nod our heads and say, oh yeah, we believe that, that's basic Apostles' Creed stuff. What do we mean when we talk about the gospel? Well, on one level, yeah, we're talking about good news. That's what gospel means. It's an old English word meaning good news. And it actually comes from the New Testament word that is the same root word for evangelism. It's for, in essence, the word we should translate, that we translate gospel or good news, should be good newsifying. You know, that we're basically sharing good news because the gospel message is not just something that we have and hold in our heads. It's something that we have and we share with others. We, we spread that good news. And so oftentimes we hear, yeah, the gospel, that means good news. Well, anytime you have good news, you pretty much also have what? This is where you're allowed to talk back. Okay. Bad news. Very good. Very good. There, <laughs> some of you remember way back in the day, we had a partnership with a black Baptist church in inner city Pittsburgh. Anybody remember that when we went and we did some worship? Some of you remember that, okay? So we took our worship team out there, and I preached out there, and we also had their choir here, and, and their pastor preached. And when we went out there to, to, for our worship team to lead and for me to preach, it was an amazing experience. Our worship team loved it, and the preaching was awesome. <laughs> and the reason the preaching was awesome was because the congregation was awesome. Because you know how it gets you in a black Baptist church, man. It's like, it's, it's back and forth, man. We, we had it going, right? You know, it's, hey, can I hear an amen? amen? You know, it's back and forth. And it was fantastic. We're in the van driving home. And somebody says to me, Dan, why can't you preach like that every week? <laughs> I said, look, I can preach black. The problem is you only listen white. Okay? So it's okay that, you know, a little feedback is good. That's not in my notes, so where am I? (laughs) That's always when Barb gets nervous. He went off script. So the gospel is good news, but we also know it's because there's bad news. The good news is so important because of the bad news that exists. The bad news is we are a people in rebellion against God. As scripture says, while we were still enemies of God, Christ died for us. The bad news part is the enemy's part. We rebelled back in Genesis chapter 3. And ever since then, we've been living under the condemnation of sin until Jesus comes and makes it possible to bring good news to say, hey, you can now have a life of freedom in Christ. And you can have the blessings and the goodness that comes from a relationship with Christ. Good news. But see, even in that, even that bad news, good news thing, we're still not getting the whole gist of the gospel. Because we might start at Genesis 3 with the bad news and then get to the good news with Jesus, but we're missing what? The first two chapters. Because the first two chapters of the Bible is good news. God created. 
And every time he created something, what did he say? That's good. And finally, when he creates humanity and he's done with all of it, he's made us in his image, what does he then say? He said, that's, oh, you guys are getting it. This is good. Very good. Unfortunately, as evangelical Christians, I think we got stuck in the bad news part of Genesis 3, and that's all we brought to the world, and then said, hey, and there's good news. But there's something that's happened in the world. The world has basically rejected this idea of we're just bad. And we're coming to say, oh, you're bad. And we've truncated the gospel. What the world needs to hear is, hey, you know what? You are made in the image of God. And God made you to flourish. God made you to thrive. God made you to be in a relationship with him where you love him and you know he loves you and your life is all that was meant to be. And people will be like, yeah, that's what I want. Then you could say the bad news is you screwed it up. <laughs> and most people are going to go, well, yeah, I kind of did. Say, but you know what? You're still made in the image of God. And he still loves you deeply. And that's why Jesus came to die for you. So that any person you lock eyes with at any time, you need to realize they're made in the image of God. And it doesn't matter. White, black, Hispanic, Asian, rich, poor, whatever. Drug addict, gay, you know, whatever it is. They are people made in the image of God, but that image has been twisted and tainted by our rebellious sin. And deep down inside, most of us know that. And we want to hear that good news. So Paul says, I came to bring you this gospel message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. But then he goes on and he talks about the impact of that gospel and what that gospel was really like. So now I'm getting into the heart of the sermon. <laughs> Three quick points, trust me. First thing Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, the gospel-focused life does not focus on the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of God says this in verses 4 and 5, My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith may not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. It's the wisdom of God that is at stake here. Now, understand who Paul is writing this to. He's writing to the Corinthians. It's a major city in Greece. He's just been to Athens doing ministry there, and he's made his way to Greece. We're in the hot heart of of philosophy of Plato and Socrates and, and the Stoics and the Epicureans and, and people who spend their entire lives doing nothing but thinking deep thoughts. <laughs> and Paul comes into that culture and says, look, I came to you not with that kind of philosophy of man, not with that kind of wisdom of human beings, but I came to you bringing the wisdom of God. And it's a completely different thing. Now, what we need to recognize as followers of Jesus is that we in many ways have bought in to the wisdom of the world and not the philosophy and the wisdom of God. We've bought into the wisdom of the world about personal safety, about physical comfort, about financial security. Three things, again, that I've just been going over again and again and just bringing back as a message for people. The wisdom of the world says, oh, be safe. And in the last year and a half, you know, what's our whole culture been about? About being safe. Not going to get into the politics of masks or no masks or any of that. I'm from Florida. We do whatever we want. <laughs> yeah. But think in general about how we approach safety. Mothers, you have realized there is not enough bubble wrap in the world for you to keep your kids safe, is there? And what happens when you focus on safety? You never feel safe. Why? Because we've made that an idol. And we're asking it to do something that only God can do. Make you safe. And guess what? God's promise is, I'm not going to make you safe. <laughs> I'm going to put you in places of danger, places of risk for the sake of the gospel. Our middle son, JT, why am I getting choked up about this? <laughs> Told this story many times. He spent a year in Egypt during Arab Spring. 
okay? In the heart of Cairo, being his father's son, he went down to the protests on occasion to see what was going on. But we had numerous people who would come up to us while he was over there to say, aren't you worried about his safety? We said, no, because before he left, we said, are you sure this is what God wants you to do? He said, yeah, I'm sure this is what God wants me to do. And so we realized he would be safer there than he would be down the hall in his bedroom. Maybe not physically, but certainly spiritually, because it's where God wanted him to be. God doesn't want to keep you safe. He wants to be with you in the midst of the danger. That's gospel wisdom as opposed to worldly wisdom. What about physical comfort? The world says, man, we want to be cushy. We want to make it nice and easy. We want to make it wonderful. I knew this was a problem after we moved to Florida. We're in Florida, okay? And there are people with heated seats in their cars. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It's 60 degrees. Oh, I got to put the seat warmers on. Don't laugh too loud. I could make fun of all of you here too. <laughs> what is that cushy, comfortable thing that you want in life? We've made comfort an idol. But here's the thing, when you make something an idol, you never feel like you get from it what you're asking. You never really feel comfortable. When you're trying to be comfortable, what do you realize? Oh, that little thing that makes you uncomfortable is what you experience and feel. You know the story of the princess and the pea? You know the story is princess, she can't sleep on her bed, it's too uncomfortable, you know, and so she wants a bed that's so comfortable when they put a pee under the mattress, she won't feel it, and eventually they're stacking mattresses high for her to sleep on, and she just, oh no, I can still feel it. Why can she still feel it? Because she's focused on the idol of her comfort, and any little thing that brings discomfort, she feels it. Your idols will never give you, give you what only God can give. And God never promises you comfort in that way. Or you think, wait a minute. The Bible talks about God comforting us all the time, and the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. So, like, why shouldn't I be cushy and soft? That's not what comfort means. Okay? Where's our music people? Music people, raise your hands. What does it mean when it says forte? With power. A fort is something that is a stronghold, a place of strength. Comfort means with strength, with power. When the Holy Spirit comes to you as a comforter, it is not to take away the hardship. It's to make you hard. It's to make you strong. It's to give you power to overcome whatever that thing is that you think is too strong for you. It's not to remove the thing. When Paul had some physical ailment that he called the thorn in his flesh, he prays to God three times, take this away, take this away, take this away, and it doesn't happen. God doesn't take it away. Instead, what God says to him in 2 Corinthians 12, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. How's that work? When I am weak, then I am strong. During Desert Storm, I had a friend who was a captain in the army. He was deployed. We were emailing back and forth a lot, talking about Bible verses, and this passage came up, and he said, I don't understand. He said, my world is all about projecting power downrange. It's about strength. How in the world can being weak be strength? I gave him this example. I said, imagine you've got some young second lieutenant out on you know, their, their first patrol, and all of a sudden they're pinned down from, from every angle. And he's thinking, man, I got to be John Wayne, and we got to go charge. And the crusty old sergeant grabs him and says, LT, no, 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 no. We are way too weak to take that position. Call in an airstrike. Call in something from above that's way stronger than we are. In recognizing his weakness, that young second lieutenant will save his men. We try to be strong in our own strength. 
And God is saying, no, 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 no. You're just weak puppies. Call in some help from above. Because then you will be strong. Way stronger than you can ever be in your own right. That's gospel truth. But what about financial security? Man, the wisdom of the world says, you need to get as much as you, you can, make as much as you can, make sure that your portfolio is big enough. And that becomes an idol. And what happens every time the market has a blip in it? Your heart skips a beat. And you never have enough. Because we've bought into the wisdom of the world and we've made an idol out of something that cannot give us what only God could give, a sense of security. When Barb and I got married, we knew that as pastor's family, we weren't going to have much. Now, most people get married, and it's 1 Corinthians 13. You know, it's, our scripture passage was Luke 12. Consider the lilies of the field. They got nothing. <laughs> but God takes care of them. And that really became the truth for us in the early days of North Park Church. Bob and Deb know this well. Our first salary on staff was the exact same thing. It was $14,400 a year. And then Barb and I went and had a couple of kids. And we did our taxes one year, and it was like, this is really cool. We're getting everything back. This is great. It was like $300 because you know, we're paying much taxes on $14,000. A couple of months later, we got another check from the IRS. Oh, something's wrong here. <laughs> Don't cash that, you know, till we found out what it was. As we're reading and understanding, they said, look, we have looked at the fact that what you make and how many kids you have, and you are now living below the poverty line, therefore we're sending you some extra money. <laughs> awesome. They did it the next year, too. The third year, we got a little bit of a raise, and we didn't get the money from the IRS. It was kind of depressing. Um, but what we learned was that God takes care of you. He meets your needs. And no matter what the amount is that we made, that's not where our security was. But the world, the wisdom of the world says, oh, that's where your security lies. Those things are idols that cannot give you what only God can give, and they will disappoint you at every turn. Next, the gospel-focused life does not focus on the power of man, but the power of God. So Paul said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Think about what Paul is saying. Paul the firebrand. You know, he's the one that's always, you think, man, he's just coming hard. He's saying, no, I was there with weakness and trembling. Because he realized, as he writes to them in 2 Corinthians, that it's in weakness that we become strong, that God does something in our lives. And it was Paul who then says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. The world tells us, here's how you go about being strong and powerful and making an impact. And we've bought into that in many ways. So we protest as the world protests. We boycott as the world boycotts. We take people to court as the world takes people to court. And we think, yeah, that's how you, you are strong and, and make a change and do things powerfully. And then Paul says, no, you do it in weakness. In weakness like Jesus on the cross who could have called down a myriad of angels in power to free him from that cross said, no, I'm going to the cross in weakness. And the result was the most powerful thing that ever happened in the history of the world, that death was overcome, that sin was wiped away for all who trust him, and eternal life was granted when we believe him. In that incredible moment of weakness, of surrendering to the powers of the day, Jesus had his greatest impact. And that's why the centurion stood there and said, this was surely the Son of God. Because there was something in that weakness that was different, that was powerful from on high. The gospel is about understanding that the greatest thing ever done in history was done by weakness, not by human power, but by the power of God. And the gospel-focused life does not focus on the glory of man, but on the glory of God. 
Paul says, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul's writing to people at the height of the Roman Empire. That other great theologically rich movie, Gladiator. No, really? <laughs> You're thinking, how is that possible? In the movie Gladiator, you hear over and over again this phrase, the glory that is, is Rome, the glory of Rome. The, that, that's what they were about. They were about glory, and glory defined in terms of power, of strength, of luxury, of wealth, of domination. That's what glory was to them, of success, of high positions of leadership, of, to the point of deifying the emperor and having celebrity worship of whoever happened to be on the seat of power. And you know what? We've bought into it in the church. The glory that the world says is glorious. How we define success. How we worship celebrity pastors. I've been listening to a podcast that Christianity Today has been doing. They're on about like the, the fifth episode. And they are, they are looking at the big picture of what they're looking at is why in the world, in the church, do we continually idolize and raise up celebrity pastors like the world raises up celebrities only to have them crash and burn? And it's so easy to point to the celebrity pastor and say it's their fault. But Christianity Today is asking the question, why do we keep raising them up? Why do we keep glorifying them? What is it in us that is bowing down to the wisdom of the world instead of to the wisdom of the gospel that says it's not about raising up a person and honoring, glorifying them. It's about glorifying Jesus. And it's about understanding that we are all broken. We are all sinful. We're all in need of the forgiving grace of Christ. And what about how we define success? And that's part of the problem with the celebrity pastor. Well, yeah, they've got all these foibles, but hey, you know what? The church is doing so great. Look at how big it's becoming, and it must be being blessed by God. Maybe not. Maybe it's just been manipulated that way by human beings. Now, in many cases, it is blessed by God. Churches are growing, and people are coming to Jesus. But the criteria, the metric is not how big and glorious the metric, the criteria is, is God being glorified by changed lives, by the humility of people who bow down to Jesus. Paul is saying, don't focus on the glory that the world sees because when the world looked for glory, they didn't see it in Jesus because he was nothing like what they expected in a Messiah. That should be a lesson for us. Here's the bottom line. The gospel is not about having an altar call at the end of a sermon. I've heard lots of legalistic sermons devoid of the gospel, and they tack on an altar call at the end and say, we preach the gospel. The gospel is not just about holding to theological truth because you can have it all appear in your head and it doesn't affect your heart at all in terms of how you deal with people. The gospel is not about changing the culture through human efforts. It's not about the power of the world. The gospel-focused life is one that says, even if I have to come in humility and trembling and in fear, I'm going to come to just bring glory to Jesus. And if it means that we face hardship and struggle and persecution, that's fine because God's going to use that where the world is going to eventually say, hey, there's something different about them because they're not reacting the way I would react being a part of the world. They're living differently because of the gospel. The gospel-focused life means that every single person you see was somebody that back in Genesis 1, God would have looked at and said, oh, very good. But who's been living a life estranged from God and broken and in need, just like you were before you came to Christ. It's so easy for us to get feeling so good about ourselves and how our lives are so good and we're following Jesus and we forget, as Paul said to these same Corinthians, when he talks about how there are so many people, you know, murderers, adulterers, you know, uh, sexual molesters, thieves, gossips, you know, 
They won't inherit the kingdom of God. And the Corinthians are going, yeah, they won't. And then Paul says, and such as you, such as you, many of you were like them. See, the gospel says this. It says you are a far more sinful, broken person than you ever believed you were. But God loves you more deeply than you can ever imagine is possible. And so you need not try to perform for God's love. You need not expect someone else to perform for God's love. But rather say, I humbly receive what God has given me. And I want to share that with anybody else who's in desperate need of the love of Christ. Let's focus on the gospel as the scriptures lay it out and live that out differently from the world so that the people of the world kind of sit up and take notice and say, maybe that's a better way. And maybe Jesus is who I really need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us and we are so undeserving of that goodness. Remind us of it every day. Remind us of that gospel that it was good news, then bad news, and good news again. And may we take that good news, bad news, good news message to the world. And may we live differently, not by the wisdom of the world, not by the world's strength, not by the world's power, but may we live by the wisdom of humility and weakness and trusting in your glory and honoring you above all else. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.